Good. You guys can stand to your feet. We're going to get started. How many's come with expectation? Amen. God's about to do something. I can feel it in the atmosphere. Just lift up your hands. Let's, uh, let's surrender right now. Father, we ask that you would come. We call upon you tonight. We welcome the presence of God in this place. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you tonight. Holy Spirit, we need you tonight. We cry out to you, Father. Come play in this place. Come awaken our hearts in this place. Come open the eyes of our hearts in this place. Come awaken us tonight. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move. Come, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you. We need a fresh outpouring in this place. Father, we cry out to you tonight that you would move, that you would move, that you would move, move upon the hearts of your people. Come, Holy Spirit, come, awaken us tonight. Father, we need more of you in this place. We welcome the healer in this place. We welcome the deliverer in this place. We welcome our Savior in this place. Father, we prepare ourselves. We humble ourselves. We make room. We make ready for you to walk in, for you to change us, for you to rearrange us, God, for you to shape us and mold us in your likeness tonight, Father.
This is why we're here tonight. Come on, lift your voices. This is our love affair with you, Jesus. What you've done for us, oh, it never gets old. It never gets old, oh. Come on, lift your voices of gratitude tonight. Come on, express your gratitude. Oh, what you've done for us, it never gets old. It never gets old. living waters flow throughout this place and engage every person here tonight Lord God with your mighty power and your mighty authority in Jesus name and let your live Not reason. 
The Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest. See it again as as the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit. Rest on us, yes. Come rest on us. As 
Come on, lift your voices. Come rest on us. Come on, get desperate. Fire and wind, come and do it again. That's it. Come on, lift your voice. Come on. Yeah, come on, like you believe it. Come on. Like you believe what you're asking. Come on. Fire. Fire and wind. song right here. Come on. This is like a sweet aroma moment. Come on. Let them burn. Oh, yes. Let it be like a sweet essence in this place arising to your nostrils, Lord. Let it be a sweet fragrance of worship and adoration before you. When I come in with leftover worship, no, this is something fresh, something new. Oh, you can have all of us, all of me. Like it cost you something. Oh. <laughs> Just rest right here. Again, 
but I want you to clap with this one because your body needs to agree with what you're saying. And I've learned that clapping is just a testament of what Jesus has done. I was, I had this really awesome, um, I think someone had said it once where they said that when you clap your hands, it annoys the devil because it reminds them that Jesus came as man and he defeated him. And so I want us as the redeemed to say so by actually doing some action, ready? So I want you to clap your hands. right here. Come on, no rush. Whew. This is worship where you just kind of, like a little olive being crushed, it's just oil starts to come out. So if it starts to pain you to worship, that's okay. Keep going through it. Let that oil come out. It counts. So come on, just begin to pour out your love song. Pour out your love song. Pour out your love song to the one who loves us best who knows us best, who loves us best, who knows us best, who loves us best, who knows us best, who loves us best. We're singing out a love song before you, Jesus, who loves us best, who knows us best, who loves us best, who knows us best, who loves us best, who knows us best. This 
is our love song. This is our love song. Who knows us best? Who loves us best? Who knows us best? Who loves us best? Who loves us best? Who knows us? This is our love song. This is our love song. Oh, who knows us best? Come on. Who loves us best? Who knows us best? Who loves us best? This is our worship. This is our love song. This is our love song to you. I believe there's somebody watching tonight that can't be here, but wish you did come. And I wanna encourage you that we have service on Sunday and you can come. <laughs> and it's not too late, you can come. But there's an atmosphere in this place that when you come in, the true presence of God is so tangible and it's so real that you have to be experienced. And if you're fighting the urge to connect, just connect to Jesus. <laughs> He's in this room and I, I pray right now that everyone that is here, that you understand what a privilege it is to be in the presence of God and the glory of God. That some people are in hospital beds that can't make it, but they can feel what's happening because there's a presence in this place. Can you just lift up a, a song of worship? Because there might be somebody watching right now and in their bedroom, they need hope and they need to feel a touch from God. And right now what's happening here, I am believing that they're gonna be feeling it in their living rooms and in their bedrooms. So come on, just lift up a voice in this place. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 peace is coming into your mind. Peace is coming in. Peace is Jesus. Peace is Jesus. Peace is Jesus. And he's stepping in the room right now. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and his garment is filling the temple. <laughs> That's what we believe in. This is why we sing it, that you are good, that you are good. This is what we believe. This is why we sing it, that you are good, that he is good. Come on, most beautiful. Lift your voice. Come on, sing that. Most beautiful. Dearest Father. Dearest Father. Yes. Most is friend. Most beautiful. Most beautiful. Sing, dearest Father. Dearest Father.
I'm a firm believer of the Lord's return. Um, and I believe that the spirit and the bride are saying, come. And the word says that those who have ears to hear, they will hear that beckoning. And I believe that the Lord is calling his bride to just step up with the spirit and partner and begin to cry out that those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will hear our song tonight to come on up, come on up. Whew. So just lift your hands and we're gonna transition here, but his presence is so good. It's so, glo the glory is here. And Lord, those who have the ears to hear and eyes to see, let them see you tonight. Yeah, just begin just to thank him. Whew. This is what he's done. <laughs> yeah. We'll never get tired of this. get tired of this. We're just seeing this one thing right here. How many people feel the tangible presence of God? Amen. Ruth had a, a, a vision and a word, so I want you to hear. Thank you, Lord. Um, it's been a long time since I've experienced this and felt this and seen this in the spirit. That I could feel the rain of anointing just coming down and pouring upon our heads, upon our shoulders, upon our feet. And I kept just feeling it and feeling it. And if we would tangibly let that oil and rain fall upon our being and permeate our souls and permeate our being, we can have a mighty move. And God is wanting to move this church and anoint this church like he's never anointed it before. And we need to really latch on to this. Let that rain and that Holy Spirit and that anointing just permeate your being. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you will just permeate our being with your presence, with your oil. And just that we could just feel the flood of your presence and your anointing coming upon this church. And strengthen it and move us forward, Lord in the anointing that you want to pour out over this body and over this church and into this um, community, Lord God. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Good word, Ruth. Good word. That word permeate. Don't just let it drip on you and drip off you. Amen. Let that presence permeate, get inside you, change you, make you new. Y'all doing all right? Amen. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, I will encourage you as we get ready to transition to prepare yourselves to con continue to dwell in his presence. Amen. Don't think you're leaving his presence because you're leaving worship to get to the word. Amen. Keep that mindset. Let's transition to tithes and offering. But as we do, greet somebody, all you people sitting down. Shh. Dale and Shanae. Thank you, Dale, for getting up. Mm-hmm. Shanae. Mm-hmm. There you go. Let's greet somebody this evening. Amen. Well, hallelujah. If you need a, an offering envelope tonight, raise your hand. The ushers will be happy to get those to you. How many people appreciate our ushers? Yeah, yeah better be everybody. Amen. Please understand they don't just pass out offering envelopes. They do a whole lot more. Amen. Hallelujah. While the ushers are passing those out, I want to I wanna welcome our guests. Let's give it up for our guests this evening. Amen. Wow, you all. Let's multitask here. Come on. Amen. <laughs> if this is your first time here, we just want to welcome you to The Rock Columbus. Uh, we are a peculiar people because we believe in the Bible. Amen. That's a peculiar people in 2022. They, we actually believe the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you have questions about how we got here, who we are, what God's doing in this house, please don't leave without getting some direction to an answer for your question, amen. But we wanna to get to know you and want you to get to know us, so we're glad you're here. For those of you watching online, welcome to The Rock Columbus from wherever you are. Uh, we wanna encourage you to continue to give by uh, Subsplash online. Those of you in the house, you can do that as well if you desire, amen. Let's pray for the offering. Father God, I just thank you, God, in the name of Jesus, Father, for the ability to uh, be profitable on this earth, Father God, by your might and your grace. So God, we just pray over this offering a blessing to every hand that gives uh, as we sow to your work here at the Rock Columbus. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> uh, God is good, amen? <laughs> There's a lot of excitement in the house and I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Amen. A couple quick announcements, and we're gonna we're gonna get Pastor Ebb up here with a special announcement, if you will. Men, in two weekends, so a week from this Saturday, you're gonna take a hike. So we're gonna utilize what our wives tell us all the time: take a hike. We're gonna utilize that. Amen. Is that a good announcement, Greg? Did I hit it? Is that good? Yeah. They tell us to take a hike, so we're going to. Amen. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. All right. Uh, Saturday, March 12th, we're going to leave here at 8 a.m. That means be here at 7.30. Amen. Be here at 7.30. We're going to leave here at 8 a.m. Uh, to head... It, there it is. Hallelujah. To head over to an area by Xenia, Ohio, Yellow Springs area, do a little hiking. So um, it's going to be an awesome time. So we're going to leave here at 8, be back around 4 p.m. or so, give or take. Amen. Uh, but we want to encourage all the men to come. Can they invite other men to come? 
amen. Invite other men to come. Uh, I encourage you to get a hold of Greg or Wayne or the other men's auxiliary leaders, the, the, the Herbs and the Dave. Hey, Dave. The bald beauties. Amen. Let them know if you're coming. It helps to plan. Amen. Hallelujah. Where's all my single folk? <laughs> I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> Raise your hands, single people. You are unmarried, but you're also unashamed. Amen. So all the married folk, that same day, you're going to be getting together at 11 to 1230. Amen. The me, I see a discussion on identity as a kingdom single. How many people know it's important to identify properly in 2022? Amen. You need to know who you are in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. So all the single folk, we want you to be there. Uh, snacks will be provided. Don't forget to invite a friend. Check out Church Center app. Every other announcement, I want to encourage you to go to Church Center app. Uh, I've had a few people ask me about baptisms, but we haven't set a date yet. Coming soon. I just threw that out there. So Pastor Brandon, Pastor Ed, sorry. Um, go to the Church Center app, click on baptism, and register. You register, you say, I want to be baptized. When you click register, we know you want to be baptized. Then we fill that puppy up, we fire it up with a little heat, and we get you baptized. Amen? But we need you to register on the Church Center app. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm excited to bring Pastor Eb up. Before I do, kiddos, get on up to your classroom. Amen. Go eat your fruit snacks and learn about Jesus. Amen. If you don't eat them, bring them to Jason. You can call me Uncle Jason if you want, but bring them to me and I'll eat them. Amen. Youth, get on back to your class, I believe. Yes? Amen. Let's welcome up our senior pastor, Pastor Eb Pena. Amen. How many are hungry after Jesus? You're here on a midweek service. Pretty sure you're hungry. Amen. We have a treat for you guys tonight. Somebody you, you already know. Some of you here may have never heard him, but it's been a while since we've had him here. Isn't that, true? Isn't that right? When was the last time you were here? Been a while. Maybe a couple months or something. Six <laughs> Hasn't been that long, has it? <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, before I bring him up, I just want to say something real quick. We know, as you guys have been hearing us preach last Thursday, we talked about the things God hates, right? And in that, we talked about divine government. If you guys were here last Thursday, you heard the message. We spoke on, touched on the spirit of Jezebel. And Pastor Dave, my pastor, the apostle, the president of the Rock organization, who I am submitted under. I'm the senior pastor of this church, but he's the apostle of the Rock organization. Been submitted under him for quite some time. And if you talk to any leader in 2022 that's been pastoring for a while, they will tell you that there's something that is affecting church and church growth. And that's the spirit of Korah, that's the spirit of Jezebel, that's the spirit of division. It is an anti-Christ, anti-authoritative spirit. And many people in the end of the age would fall prey to that. The Bible talks about the apostate church. Everybody say apostate church. What does that mean? They would no longer, they would no longer endure sound doctrine. They would for, have a form of godliness but deny the government of God. And how many here know that in heaven there is a form of government? Okay? God is not, he will never honor anyone who's not under any form of authority. And I, we say it here often. If you're not under authority, you're not in authority. And so I wanted, since we've been on that vein, I wanted my pastor, Apostle Dave Chisholm, to come in, because he's an apostle. I'm a pastor. I mean, you know the fivefold ministry. There's different levels, right? There's different um, mantles. There's a different weight. Y'all have heard me preach some crazy messages before, and sometimes the stuff comes out hard, but I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a, a little schoolgirl compared to Pastor Dave Chisholm, because he can bring the heat, and y'all know that, right? So I wanted him to come in, you know, and I asked him, I'm like, can you, he was supposed to come last uh, Thursday, but he had some stuff going on. I wanted him to come in this Thursday and share what I believe is going to be a rhema word for this body. 
We are going somewhere as a rock church in 2022. And listen to me clearly for those people that are streaming that are not with us. The unity of this body is paramount. It's paramount. I haven't said it in a long time. We're not just building a church. We're trying to build a family. And every family is messy. And we need to be equipped, biblically equipped, to be able to endure one another. Can I get an amen? amen. So without further ado, are you guys ready? Yes. I know you all sat down, got comfy, but I want you to stand and let's honor the president of the Rock organization. My pastor, my spiritual dad, Apostle Dave Chisholm. Uh, amen. If you would, please remain standing as I preach the word. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Believe me, I don't let it go to my head, right? I'm still the donkey Jesus rides to church. Amen. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Amen. <laughs> well, hallelujah. Good to see everybody. It's been a minute. When I say six months since I've been here, it hasn't been six months since I've been here. It's been six months, I think, since I preached here. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Lots been happening. Lots been happening. God's been killing me. <laughs> and so tonight I'm going to invite you to the funeral. <laughs> how many y'all ready? How many y'all ready to die gracefully tonight? Amen. I mean, if you're going to die, you might as well enjoy it. Because you're going to die tonight. Amen. I'm fixing to kill the old man. Amen. Amen. Just, just lift up your hands and say, I'll take the nails, Jesus. Amen. I'll take the nails. Hallelujah. Ain't Velcro. It held him to the cross. <laughs> you know what a seeker-friendly church really is? It's a church of Velcro instead of nails. Amen. Hallelujah. But we're going to get into some stuff tonight that... The Lord's been dealing with me about, and uh, since, since December, literally, the Lord has just been coming at us with wave after wave of, and, and it is a spirit of revival, but to revive something is a process, and it kind of started with a word God gave me, because I, I started saying, God, I want to see more of your manifest presence. I want to see more of your power because too many people are coming in the church bound and leaving bound. Right? I'm a miracle of deliverance and so are most of you. But I want to see more. I'm not satisfied. I'm free. I want to see the world free. You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying to the Lord, you know, this is in December, around Christmas time. I'm saying, Lord, I want to see more of your power. I want to see more of your glory. I want to see people come in, and I want to see them set free. You know, my passion and my heart is to see the captive set free. Amen? That's my passion. That's what I carry. You know, I, I believe in Jesus, the deliverer, because I needed deliverance. And, uh, you know, some people say, I, I want to see Jesus, the healer. Maybe you've been you know, walk through a deadly disease. And so the passion, like me and Pastor Brian always joke around. I say, he has a passion to get your body healed, and I got a passion to get your mind renewed, your head healed. Amen? But they're both a good passion from Jesus. So we're tag teaming, you know. So I'm, I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, I want to see more of you. I want to see more of you. And the Lord answered, and it was an answer I wasn't expecting. He said, well... If you want more of me, I guess you're going to have to change because I'm not. Can someone say, ouch? Can someone say, oh, snap? Right? If you want more of him, what's stopping that from happening? His reluctance? No. But we have resisted him. <laughs> You know what, I, I was with uh, Andrew Walmack, I don't know, 15 years ago probably, maybe, yeah, about 15 years ago, we were in the mountains with a group of, a small group of pastors, and, and I used to go up there with a group of pastors for like 10 years, and we'd spend a week together. 
And uh, Andrew Womack had come in that time, and he had a, um, a cool thing, and he had these little stickers, and he gave all of us these little window clings, you know, like you put on your mirror. And it stayed on my bathroom mirror for 15 years until I just moved. And it said, do not, and it had one of them things, and it said, limit God, and then it had a circle around it with a cross through it. And it was out of that psalm that said, you've limited the Holy One of Israel. Man, wouldn't it be crazy to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and realize how much we limited God's work in our life because of our own stubbornness? Because we're calling for him to come down and he's calling for us to come up. Right? We're calling Jesus come down and he's saying, well, why don't you come up? And so I have had a series of visitations and I can't get through them all tonight. But I want to just hit on one thing because Pastor Ed was sharing about his lamentation to see a spirit of unity in the house so that we can grow in a momentum, you know, in this city and in this, this work right here. So tonight we're going to talk about the spirit of revival and we're going to talk about a root issue that stops it. And we can talk about a lot of things, but I want to get, it, you know, they'll say you want to change the fruit you got to change the root, right? Because the root determines the fruit, right? Okay. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to expose an iniquity in our church. How many of y'all know what iniquity is? How many of y'all know the difference between, and I've taught it here before, the difference between sin and iniquity? There's two different words in the Bible, right? Sin means to miss the mark. Iniquity means to bend out of shape. It's to warp something. So what an iniquity is, and this is what iniquity is. Whenever you read in the Bible, and you'll see it all through the Bible, it says your sins and your iniquities have separated us. You know, we had a move, and a lot of you were able to come down in our early winter camp meeting there. And, and we had a lot of repentance based out of this thing of God's telling me, you want to get more of me, you're going to have to change because you're limiting me with your disobedience because a holy God cannot manifest in a greater measure among a disobedient people, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at how this thing is playing out and an iniquity is when we say something God said is wrong, but we change it and say it's right. That's an iniquity. So that's when a sin becomes an iniquity. It's when we say abortion is a woman's right. It's right. You put abortion and right in the same sentence and something's wrong. The only way you can actually do that is reverse it and say abortion is not right. Right? <laughs> right? But, what, but our whole nation has now filled herself with iniquity. Same-sex marriage is now in America an iniquity. When the president painted the White House, the, the homosexual flag rainbow, that night... America stepped into a new level of resisting God and inviting judgment. Amen. And our children are going to pay the prices for these things, right? Now, let's look at this in Jeremiah 8, verse 8. How can you say we are wise and we've written, we have the written law of the Lord and learned its language and teachings? I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Behold, the truth is, the lying pen of the scribes has made the law a falsehood. And you could say it this way. The lying preachers in the pulpits have changed the gospel message of Jesus Christ into where it's not truth anymore. Right? The lying pen of the scribes. Because the preachers are the scribes. They're the keepers of the word of God. You know, the... the the deception and delusion of American Christians rests upon 
the fault of the pulpits, right? Because they chose to please men. He said, you've made it a mere code of ceremonial observances. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken captive. Behold, they've rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom and broad and full intelligence is in them. Therefore, I will give their wives to others. Someone say 50% divorce rate in the church. And their fields to those who gain possession of them. Someone say, I keep losing all my money. Therefore, when we look at this, it says, even the greatest, from the least to the greatest, is given to covetousness, is greedy for unjust gain. From the, You know, they did a survey, I think it was about a year ago I read this, and they surveyed a bunch of like 18 to 21-year-olds, and they asked them, what is your goal to be in life? And nearly half of them answered, a celebrity. Yeah, nearly half of them. Why? Because is all I got to do is go viral. All I got to do is get, is all I got to do is make some kind of goofy, crazy thing on YouTube, and I never have work again a day in my life. I mean, you see like Mr. Beast. How many of y'all see Mr. Beast? He's one of the top YouTubers in the world. He's got almost, he's working almost one million followers. And you know what he does? He gives away crazy money. That's all he does. And the little kids are the ones who's watching him. The little kids, you know. I didn't know who he was until I got around my grandkids. They said, Papa, have you seen Mr. Beast? And I said, no. And they said, watch this. And they click on this video. And he knocks on the door with a pizza. He said, did you order pizza? And they say, yeah. And he goes, okay, I'm going to give you the house. Or, yeah, no. He orders pizza. The pizza driver comes to his house, hands him the pizza, and he hands the pizza driver the keys to the house, and he gives him the home just because he was the one that brought the pizza. He does the insane things like this. Gives away millions of dollars a year. Just gives it away. He'll just randomly call someone up and hand them $100,000, and that's all he does. And so why not? Heck, I'd like to do that for a living. <laughs> you know, I would love to do that for a living. So when we look at the covetousness and the twisted things that are happening in our culture that social media is being used to conspire, it's, it's really weird. He said, now everyone from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely, for they've healed the wound of the daughter of my people only lightly and slightly. Who? The prophet and the priest have healed the wound, one translation says superficially. Or you put a Band-Aid on a infected wound and told them, go in peace, you'll be fine. And then they get gangrene and cut and their leg falls off. So he says, here's how they do it. They say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They say, you're okay with God when you're not okay with God. You know, we had a, something happen this morning, and every day something happens. But this morning I was in a conversation, and, and uh Dennis grabbed me, and he said, hey, man, listen to this. And so a person had invited, uh, had been dating someone outside our church, and they were in a, a, a Baptist church. And uh, they started telling this girl about the full gospel. And at first they were resistant. Oh, no, no. And then said, why don't you read your Bible? So they did a little Bible study. Well, the girl lit up. She goes, it does say that. So, you know what she did? She went straight to her pastor. And she sat down with him and said, why have you been telling me the Holy Spirit gift stopped when Paul died? When the Bible says in Mark 16, 15, and he looked at her and basically blew her off. So then she's sitting in Dennis's office the next day saying, what do I do now? I just found out. My pastor's been lying to me, 
and misleading me. I didn't know there was anything else. She was bit by the Holy Ghost. She got a revelation. And now she, she goes, and this is what she said to Dennis, I'm accountable now. I can't act like, I can't unread this. I can't unhear this. And I went, oh, do I remember when that happened to me in 1982. Boy, do I remember when that happened to me. And I just looked at her, I said, well, her days are numbered. I'll give her two weeks. I'll give her two weeks to show up here for a service because she's done. She found out someone was saying peace, peace when there was no peace. Someone lying. Somebody wasn't giving her the fullness of God. Now she's ruined for any other, right? And this happens constantly. Now, this is something. He says, they brought shame because they committed abominations, extremely disgusting and shamefully vile things, and yet they were not at all ashamed, nor could they blush. Wow. Sounds like our culture. Sounds like our culture. They can't even blush. They don't even have a consciousness that what they're doing is wrong. They can't even blush. You know, I'm gay and I'm proud. I live with my boyfriend. I live with my girlfriend. I'm proud. You know? I do all this. I do all this. And I'm proud of it. I'm not ashamed of my sin. I can't even think about it. They can't even blush. So my grandkids had told me, Mr. Beast. Papa, he's a Christian. I always want to know what my grandkids are listening to. So Pat Paul goes online. And Pat Paul finds an interview. And Pat Paul finds out Mr. Beast is not a Christian. He ain't even close to being a Christian. He's a beast. <laughs> so they they try this interviewer tries to corner him. Well, are you a Christian? And he just he won't answer. He won't answer. And uh, then he, he's cursing in the interview. Now, he don't curse on the videos because he knows nine-year-olds are watching him. They're who made him famous. So I called my grandkids, and I called their parents, and I said, Mr. Beast is no longer welcome on my iPad. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So he goes on to say, they were not ashamed, nor could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Now, this was a bad state Israel had gotten into because the prophet and the priests were not healing the people. They were allowing them to believe a lie. They were given over to the things of the world, the things of covetousness, and God said it's going to bring judgment on them. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 7, verse 9. And he said to them, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. This is what I'm going to challenge you with tonight because what I'm going to tell you tonight is going to be tough because most people in this room are guilty of it, but you don't see it as sin. Even though the Bible says it's sin, you don't see it as sin. Why? Because of your tradition, right? Right? But wouldn't you want to know if something was keeping more of God from you? That's why I say you got to die gracefully tonight. I mean, I had some resistance on this message in Parkersburg. I had some people say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, is this what the Bible says or not? Yeah, that's what it says. Well, but this is the way we've always done it. He said, full well do you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever curses father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man shall say of his father and mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, whatever so mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. That had to do with the firstborn son having the responsibility of caring for the parents as they got elderly, and the firstborn son would come up and say, well, I've taken the money that I should have used to take care of my parents, and I give a gift to the ministry, and so I'm free because they didn't want to take care of the parents. And so Jesus said, making 
the word of God of no effect. Why? Because of your tradition. Now, I'm going to kill a tradition in here tonight. And this is a tradition. What does it take to make fire? Three things, right? Oxygen, air, fuel, ignition, right? Three things to make fire. So when we talk about church government, if we can remove one of those three things, we can eliminate a lot of problems in the church when it comes to the fire of rebellion that we all are born with. And live with to some degree. Because everyone in this room has a measure or a degree of rebellion that you're dealing with against God's constituted authority, direct and indirect. Civil. Come on, how many all speed? Jason, where are you at? Liar! Aunt Candace called you out. She's pulling. This is a man right here which is civil disobedience, which is a form of, now, I don't think you'll go to hell for speeding, but you may get some tickets on the earth. Amen? You may need Mike's services, like I did on 270 at Gahanna Exit a couple years ago. You weren't going to tell. I called Mike. I said, can you help a brother out? He said, Gahanna, he said, no, not Gehenna. They're the, that's the unpardonable sin in Gehenna. You could have got caught in Reynoldsburg or Pickerington, not Gehenna. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> he, he worked his magic, and I had a license plate light bulb burn out. Yeah, I did. Thank you, Jesus. This, too, is a miracle of God. So, <laughs> we have a tendency to, uh, we're, we're going we're to work on this a little bit tonight, and I think it will really help you, but even more, it's going to help your children, because without realizing it, we're cursing our children, and you'll see it here in a minute. We're cursing our children, and we don't even know it. Isn't it crazy? that we think we're blessing someone and indeed we're offering them a curse. Wouldn't that be crazy to do that? All right. Now let's go to, well, first of all, he said this. He said, you make the word of God have no effect through your tradition, which you've delivered, and many like such things do you do. And when he called the people unto him, he said unto them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand there's nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. That was revelation to the Jews because they're all thinking, I got defiled because I didn't wash my hands before I ate. I got defiled because I ate a piece of bacon with my eggs this morning. But Jesus said, that's really not the problem. I gave you those ceremonial things for your own health benefits. But this is not what's defiling you. He said, the things that come out of him, that's what defiles him. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. Right? That's pretty serious, isn't it? All right, now let's go to 1 John 2.15. First, I want to read this in the New King James Version. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now I want to read it in the Amplified Version. Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification, 
the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, one's own resources or in the stability, assurance in a one, one's own resources or stability of earthly things. These things do not come from the Father, but from the world, right? So we got three things here, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and what's the third one? Pride of life. How many of you ever looked at your child and said, I'm proud of you? How many of you ever been told, I'm proud of you? How many of you all have told someone, man, I'm proud of you? Right? It's kind of a tradition, isn't it? Why? How many of y'all teach, you know, have, we know we've taught our children, you need to be proud. The few, the proud, the Marines. You need to be proud of yourself for what you've done. Oh, you won. I'm so proud of you. That's human. That's earthly. That's sensual. And it's demonic. It's getting quiet now. Come on. I've had to correct myself at least four times since I preached this. Because I heard myself say, Oh, I'm proud of you, honey. I, I, excuse me. I'm not proud of you. I'm pleased at how you're blessing or how you're obeying God. Why? In heaven, pride is a curse word. I will prove this. In heaven, pride, you might as well throw an F-bomb at the throne. Come on. Pride is a curse in heaven. It's a curse. And we count it as a blessing. Everybody say, by your tradition, you make the word of God ineffective. All right. Here we go. Let's read it now in the Passion Translation. Don't set your affections, the affections of your heart, on this world or in loving the things of this world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with status and importance. What's the real root of all rebellion? What got the devil kicked out of heaven? It was, well, let me give you a clue first. It wasn't smoking cigarettes. It got the devil kicked out of heaven. What was found in him that got him kicked out of heaven and cursed for eternity? So we're trying to put in our children what got the devil kicked out of heaven by tradition. Dang. <laughs> right? I mean, how many times, Ed, have you looked at Allie or Lay or Heather and said, I'm proud of you, babe? Not lately. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But listen, how subtle is the enemy. How subtle that he can take what God hates and get us to reproduce it wholesale and sow it into one another. I'm proud of myself. Why? Well, I did this today. You devil. You devil. None of these things comes from the Father, but from the world. 
And this world and its desires are in the process of passing away. But those who love to do the will of the Father or God will endure forever. Or they'll live forever. All right? Let's drive this nail home one more time. In the Living Bible. Stop loving this evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love these things, you show that you really do not love God. For all these worldly things, these evil desires, the craze for sex, the ambition to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and self-importance, these are not from God. They are from this evil world itself. Amen. Now, let's go to the book of Proverbs. I heard this the other day, and I loved it. I heard a preacher say this. The book of Proverbs is the parent God provided for the orphan or the dysfunctional child. The book of Proverbs is the daddy or mommy you never had. My daddy didn't teach me anything. God has sent the manual of parent to every child. All they have to do is open it up and read the manual. Everything your father or mother did not teach you, God gives you that instruction himself personally. We call it the Bible. Amen? That delivers us from being a victim to a victor. Hallelujah. It takes us out of dysfunction to function. It takes us out of excuses into destiny. Amen. All right, so we're going to start in Proverbs, and I'm going to go through several of these. I'm not going to exhaust the Bible because it would take us two or three services. I'm just going to pick a few of the many. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. What's the next thing on the list? The fear of the Lord is to hate pride. Wait a minute. I'm poor, but I'm proud. That was a big saying when I was a kid. I'm poor, but I'm proud. We're taught pride from childhood. Proud of you, honey. So proud of you. Be proud. Be proud of who you are. Don't you let nobody take advantage of you. You be proud of who you are. Oh, really? I thought God hated pride. Arrogance and the evil way. So he equates pride and arrogance to evil. <laughs> e, how this evil. <laughs> All right. Let me read this. I'm going to read this 8, 13, and 14 in the Passion Translation. For I am wisdom, and I am shrewd and intelligent. I have at my disposal living understanding to devise a plan for your life. Wisdom pours into you. Catch this, guys. Wisdom pours into you when you... Begin to hate every form of evil in your life. For well, that's what worship and fearing God is all about. Then you will discover that your pompous pride and your perverse speech. So God also, like I said, in heaven, pride is a curse word. He likens it to perverse speech. The very ways of wickedness that I hate. So when you said, honey, I'm so proud of you, God went, oh, man, I hate that when you do that. Oh, snap. Am I making this stuff up? Are, are we reading the same Bible? So how do we get through a lifetime without seeing this? 
man, because of your traditions, you've made the Word of God ineffective. And the very things we're fueling is actually building a fire of rebellion against all authority in our very hearts. Because at the root of rebellion is the sin of pride. Think about this. Think about this. He was a very humble man who walked in extreme humility and led a rebellion that split the church. You would go, well, he don't sound very humble and to me. See what I'm saying? Think about it. Like I say, let's remove either the oxygen or the fuel or the spark, and the fire goes out because you got to have all three for them to work, right? Pride and rebellion. These things work to build a fire against God and what he wants to do in the earth and what he wants to do in your family. All right, let's go to Proverbs 6, verse 16. There are six evils God truly hates. In other words, you say, oh, God really hates that one. Oh, there's a lot of wrong in the world, but he picked six, which is the number of man. And he said, I'm going to tell you the ones. Oh, you, yeah, there's a lot of things I don't like, but I'm going to tell you what I hate. Has God ever changed? He changed covenants, but did he change? So if he hated something in the old covenant, does he hate it in the new covenant? He just removed the curse that's on us if we choose the obedience to obey him. He delivered us from the curse of our own doings. All right. Six things God hates. Putting others down while considering yourself superior, spreading lies and rumors. And by the way, putting yourself, others down while you considering yourself superiors in the King James says a proud look. What is a proud look? Now, how do we, when we are in, okay, the, to understand the, the truth of the kingdom You have to understand submission because you're only in the kingdom of Jesus Christ to the degree you can come under his rule, which is called government, right? And God has three lines of rule that go from heaven to earth, and those lines are three lines of authority, okay? The first which is the most powerful, is kingdom. Jesus is the king, and we are the subjects of his kingdom. And when we become a subject, which means we subject ourselves under his governance, then we receive a spirit of adoption, So he takes you from being a subjected servant or just a, you know, a person in his kingdom to a spirit of adoption to now you become part of his kingdom, which makes you kings and part of his priesthood, which makes you priests. So he said, I've made you a kingdom of priests. That's the highest honor he could ever give us. And that's what happens if we truly subject ourselves. But it begins with submission. What's submission mean? Submit, woman. That ain't what it means. (laughs) Submit, woman. Submission means you come under the mission. Okay, what was the mission? First of all, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. That's our mission. 
So when we make that the main purpose of our life, first of all, on earth, I've got, I'll be 63 in a few days, right? 63 in a few days. So I have to say, until I die, the goal of my life is to submit my life on earth under his mission, submission, right? That's what I got to do. That means I've got to love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and love you like myself. Submission, right? That's how the kingdom works. Well, the devil, he knows how powerful that can be. And so he throws, he starts throwing, you know, I was watching in Ukraine, and please pray for Ukraine. You know, we want to keep praying for Ukraine. It's horrible what's happening there. This evil dictator just marches in and says, I want your car and takes it. I want your land and takes it. I want your home and takes it. Now you're mine. Evil, pure, unadulterated evil, right? But think about what is happening. I mean, it's crazy. The rebellion in the nations, the rebellion in in the systems of government. Every time our government stands up and calls something God said is wrong, right. They're manifesting a spirit of pride. Pride is self-assurance. Pride is self-obsession. Pride is self-promotion. Pride is thinking you're better than someone else. And that's what Satan does for a living. Is he walks around and he passes out pride cards and then he gets you to pass them out to your friends and family and your children and he fuels rebellion against God's authority. How many of y'all believe you deserve more than you have now? Nobody's going to answer. Of course you're not because you know you'd be crucified. But you know and I know there are times we pray and our voice to God is saying not, thank God things are as good as they are. I don't deserve nothing. And I thank you, Father. You've told me they're going to get even better. Instead, we go saying, I don't understand why he got the job and I didn't. Who are you? I'm just a servant. Why did he get a raise and you didn't? You work harder than he does. Do you understand? That's pride. Well, I really did deserve it. I know that's real pride. (laughs) You've already judged yourself. Paul said, I don't even judge myself. I'm going to let God do it because he'll be more gracious on me than I am. Okay. So... You put others down while you consider yourself superior, spreading lies and rumors, spilling the blood of the innocent. You know, our youth pastor and one of our associate pastors, Greg Nangle, you all know Greg. So last night, after worship, he comes up, tells Dennis, I got something I got to share. So he gets up, and he says, I need to confess before this church. And we're like, what'd you do, Greg? (laughs) What'd you do? And I'm sitting there going, what's he doing? What'd he do? And he goes, I have to confess because I have disobeyed God's word. And we're all like, oh, crap. What'd you do, Greg? <laughs> What'd you do, man? And then he starts saying, I have not prayed for my president because I've been so mad at him. I quit praying for him. I haven't prayed for him with my heart. I haven't prayed for his salvation and deliverance from deception. Instead, I've been angry with him. And I have to confess this before this church. And then he went on to read the scriptures. Pray for those who are in authority over you. 
and for your government that you may lead a peaceable life on the earth. It's easy to complain about our government, whether it's a mayor, a governor, whoever, a president, a vice president. It's easy to complain about them. And I'll still complain. But I'm going to pray, and I have prayed for them, and I will pray for them, and I won't allow a political division in the sense of I, I understand the good and evil thing, but we're to pray for someone who's deceived for the light of Christ to shine in their hearts because what would happen if he got saved? Everything would change overnight. Instead of praying for him to die and then praying for the vice president to die and then praying for the speaker of the house to die, let's pray for them all to get saved. Because a lot of people say, I'm praying for Joe Biden just to die. And I said, well, what are you going to do about his replacement? Well, yeah, uh, well, I'm going to pray she dies too. And what about her replacement? I mean... We're going to be down to the dog catcher before we find a righteous person to take over. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Plotting evil in your heart toward another. Gloating over doing what's plainly wrong. Spouting lies and false testimony and stirring up strife between friends. These are entirely despicable. To God. Yo. What does, let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask, I know we got one man with a doctorate in here. I have a doctor, but it's honorary. It ain't real. <laughs> you know. <laughs> People say, did you earn your doctorate? I said, you go pastor for 40 years and tell me that. You know what you do? You send a guy in a school for four years or two years or four years, and you tell him to memorize stuff and then rewrite it down, and you call him a doctor, and I build churches for 40 years, and you say, is your doctorate earned? No pride. Right? No pride. <laughs> Darn, Mike. You're killing me here, brother. You're killing me. But I have, I, I care less. But anyway. We have a man here, at least one in here, that has a, a doctor of law. But what does higher education do to us? I mean, do you know the average family will sacrifice everything, including having their children in the house of God through their childhood and adolescence to get them into an institution that will destroy the very foundation of faith you live for. You know it and I know it. The most antichrist system in America is the liberal arts universities that we will die to get our children in. We send them away and four years later they come home and we don't recognize them. They come back so full of crap they come back so full of crap. I remember in 11th grade when I went to a new form of schooling called vocational school. I walked into an English classroom in 11th grade, and there was a teacher. I remember her name. It was Miss Reader. And the first thing I heard the whispers of, she's a lesbian. Well, you got to remember in 1976... That was still a whisper, right? There wasn't nobody waving no colored flag in 1976. If you said you were a lesbian, you were like a, a leper to society, right? It wasn't celebrated. It was condemned. Well, I'll never forget because we go in Miss Reader's classroom and we're all like, dude, she's a lesbian, you know? We're all talking. We're 17-year-old we're kids in 1976. Three's company had just started trying to desensitize us, right? When John Ritter acted like he was gay just so he could live with them two girls. That was how homosexuality was 
desensitized. That was how they always use comedy to desensitize us. This is how iniquities are born. It has to come through some form of comedy. Com- comedians many times are the social architects of changing culture. They're prophets in a way because they find the irony in everything. And they get us to laugh about it. And the minute we laugh, we drop our defenses and we're open to change. Satan's good. He's he's got skills, man, right? So anyway, I'm sitting there and I'll never forget. She said, now we're not going to be a traditional class like you've been in for the last 11 years. So she took And she said, now push all the desks to the wall. And she put our seats in a circle. And I'll never forget, she said, now this year we're going to talk about what makes your parents right. Why do you believe whatever they tell you? Why when they tell you something's wrong do you believe it? Why don't you begin to think for yourself? And that's what every Just nearly every professor in every university is coming at your children with to divorce you. When my daughter, Nicole, who is a righteous young woman, righteous young woman, when she went to a little tiny WVUP, right, little school, you know, West Virginia University of Parkersburg, small school, She came home the first day from what was the class they had, Josh, where every freshman has to start off where they tell you they're going to change your ethics. And everyone had to take it. And what they told her, she came home, she said, Dad, you aren't going to believe this. First day of college in a little tiny school in Parkersburg. Right? This ain't like Ivy League school in Massachusetts, Boston or something. They said, when we get done with you in one semester, we will change your values. We will change what you believe is right or wrong. And she came home and told me that. And I said, well, she goes, good luck. (laughs) And guess what? They didn't change any of my girls. My, all three of my girls had to sit through that class where they tell you wrong is right and right is wrong and everything your parents told you is wrong and you need to think for yourself and you just don't believe something's wrong because some antiquated old style told you it was wrong and they brainwash your children and they tell them, now you're the smart ones. You have a degree. You're the ones who really know what's happening. And these liberal theologians, if you will, infect your children's minds like a worm that eats away all their values and just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But we as parents will sacrifice anything to get them before them professors I told my four girls, I said, or th- four girls, I told my three girls, I said, here's the deal. I will pay for your bachelor's degree, but you will live in my home and you will go to a local school where I can monitor everything. You will spend every night in my house or you're on your own. Daddy will pay for everything or daddy will pay for nothing. I want to go to Marshall. I want to go to Morgantown. I said, go ahead. Have fun. See ya. And by the way, uh, that's not your car. That's mine. Leave the keys on the counter when you leave. Oh, man. One of my daughters got, she had a full ride. She got so mad at me because I wouldn't let her go to Morgantown to be demonized. She was already demonized enough. She didn't need Morgantown. (laughs) Why'd she, Josh? Josh grew up with her, man. He tell you, she was a hellion, man. I said, you ain't going to. She got so mad at me, she lost her scholarship on purpose to spite me, and I had to spend tens of thousands of dollars to pay for her education, forcing her to get up and go to school every day when I shouldn't have had to pay a dime. She did it to spite me. 
lost her scholarship. Oh, yeah. I love being a parent. <laughs> I'm so glad it's over. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Josh. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, meo. I don't know which way you're going to go, you know, with your look at your kids. All right. <laughs> so, my son, obey your father's godly instruction. Follow your mother's life-giving teaching. Fill your heart with their advice and let, their li let your life be shaped by what they've taught you. You say, well, my mom and dad ain't teaching me nothing right. That's why we got the book of Proverbs. That's why you have a pastor. That's why you have mentors in the church. That's why you have a generation in front of you that made some of the same stupid mistakes you're about to, and you need to listen to them. Amen. I had to pull up one of our young men the other day, pulled him up in front of the church. I said, you're about to make the dumbest decisions of your life, and you're going to pay for them all. You better check your course right now. And thank God that young man received that correction, changed his course, and I know it will change his life forever because he was about to do one of the dumbest things I ever heard of a young Christian man. Amen. Their instruction will whisper to you at every sunrise and direct you through a brand new day. For truth is a bright beam of light shining into every area of your life, instructing and correcting you to discover the ways to godly living. Now, Proverbs 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full. And so the eyes of a man are never satisfied. I want you to remember that, that God used that verse as a young man to restrain me from wanting more than I have and wanting more than he's apportioned me. And I want you to realize something. God created a portion for you when he created you. There's a part of creation that God predetermined that could be yours if you will possess it. But you have a portion. And you have to learn to live within your portion. How do I know if I'm living within my portion? Well, if I have to do anything wrong to get more. If I have to lie, cheat, steal. If I have to twist. If I have to turn. If I have to shrug the truth. If I have to manipulate. If I have to flatter. If I have to do anything God hates to get promoted, then now I've left my portion. If I can't walk in complete humility and submission to the kingdom, then I'm self-promoting. And that is pride. That is pride. You know what my greatest battle was as a young pastor? Spiritual pride. It was my greatest battle. I mean, I fought and fought because I always thought I should have had more. Or no matter how big the church was, it should be bigger. Why? Who are you? And man, I had to be cut down over and over and over by the Lord. I had to be corrected and admonished. And I had to keep pounding. And here's the thing. This thing has a life of its own inside of us. It has a life of its own. Bible says rebellion is locked in the heart of every child and the rod of correction will drive it far from them. Don't spare the rod. You will deliver their soul from hell. That's what the Bible tells us. Well, Dr. Spock, in my generation it was Dr. Spock. He was a psychologist. It wasn't the guy on Star Trek with the pointy ears. No, no, not him. This was the most famed psychiatrist who convinced every parent in America, never lay a hand on your child in discipline. Never spank them because you're damaging them. Well, guess what? His daughter committed suicide. Didn't work too good for him. All right. Job 41.33. On earth... 
on earth there's nothing like him, which is made without fear. Now, if you read the first 32 verses of Job 41, you will hear a description of a monster called Leviathan, right? And it describes this monster, this like sea monster, and it says he is made without fear. And it talks, it describes him. It says when he goes through the deep, the, the waters boil as he passes. It gives all these descriptions. You can go back and read it yourself. And when I found this way back in the 80s as I was studying the Scripture, when I read this, it rocked my world. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. Snap. If you walk in pride, Satan is your king. Think about that, man. If you walk in pride, what do we do to our young gifted athletes? What, do we, what monsters do we create by exalting them because they have a genetic difference? There's nothing fair in any sport. There's nothing fair in education. Do you know who excels in education? Do you know who's rewarded? Only him who is born with a memory to recall. If you have a memory to recall, you go to the top of education. If you have genetics to jump high, if you're tall, I missed the lottery on that one. <laughs> if you're tall, if you're fast, you're exalted and told you're the best. No. You're a genetic anomaly. You're no better than the guy that can't run as fast as you. You're no better than the guy who's one thousandth of a second behind you in the hundred yard dash. But we create these monsters with pride. And then as parents, we half half of, you know, one thing I've learned by pastoring for, for 30, you know, a long time. <laughs> 37 years. You know what I've learned? Half of the idolatry of sports and children is not even the children. It's the parent wanting a star for a child. Ain't got nothing to do with that kid. Oh, sports develop all kinds of good things. I mean, yeah, it, it does teach them some disciplines, but boy, it sure fuels the spirit of pride in them. And again, I'm not anti-sports. I'm just saying we got to teach our children the balance. God's gifted you. How about saying that instead of I'm proud of you? How about saying God's gifted you? Now give him glory for what he's done. You couldn't have run that race if God hadn't given you that ability. Now you're not creating a freaking monster. You're creating a kid that will be thankful for what he's been given. See the difference? All right, let's look at Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes shame. You know, I can give an altar call in any church in America and probably get 70% of the congregation on an altar call for how many of y'all fight shame. Do you know shame is the fruit of pride? <laughs> what? When pride comes, the fruit of pride is shame. Why? No matter how fast you are, someone will be faster. And you took your identity and how fast you were, but then this guy beat you. And even if you're the fastest person alive, have you seen Arnold Schwarzenegger lately? He don't look like a Terminator anymore. He looks like he's half terminated. He ain't looking at the world anymore saying, I'll be back. He's looking at the world saying, I came back too many times. I'm wore out. I'm a victim of steroids. Come see Dwayne Johnson in about another 15 years. He'll be on dialysis too. 
I was the rock. Now they call me the pebble. <laughs> I was Bam Bam and now I'm pebbles. <laughs> but with the humble, there is wisdom. But the world don't exalt humility. Not today they don't. Not today they don't. But are you looking for exaltation from the world or from God? But if I'm humble, they'll take advantage of me. They might, but God won't. Ask Joseph how that worked out. Ask every patriarch. Think about this. I'm, I'm going to hurry. I'm going to hurry. Okay. Proverbs 13.10. By pride comes nothing but strife. You know why? A man and a woman in a thing called a marriage can't get along over half the time because they're both full of pride. And what comes from pride? Strife. I want it my way. Why well, want it my way? Well, why should you have it your way and I not have it my way? What if we both looked at each other and said, is there anything I can do for you? Can I be a better husband? Can I be a better wife to you? Yeah, do this. I ain't doing that. <laughs> Sounded good in a marriage seminar. Until I got home and you asked me to actually do something. I just, come on, Sonia. You know what I'm talking about. You're a counselor. I'll never forget one of my ultimate memories of marriage counseling was how I had this couple in and they could not get along. They could not get along. And they'd come in for like the 20th time and they're sitting in front of my desk in the chairs and I said, what's the problem? And this woman said, he acts like the devil. And the man jumped up and said, she is the devil. <laughs> I'll never forget that as long as I live. <laughs> Hope it works out for you. <laughs> By pride comes nothing but strife. Why? Because I should have more. I should be in charge. I should have been promoted. I, I, I. You know what the center letter of the word pride is? What's the center letter of the word sin? Everybody say, I mean my. He's got to die. Hmm. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction. Ouch. And a holy spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Uh, James 4, 1. What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Well, we already know that. The Bible says from pride comes nothing but strife. Doesn't the battle begin inside of you? Everybody say, what comes from the inside defiles a man? Not the outside. It's what comes from the inside. Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? You jealously want what others have. So you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme with envy and harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. And all the time you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And if you ask, you won't receive it because you're asking with corrupt motives, seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair with an unholy relation, in an unholy relationship with the world. 
Wow. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? What do you think about homosexuality? Well, you know. I was interviewing a couple that new to the church Sunday morning, and I said, uh, hey, uh, see you all been coming to church? Yeah, yeah. And the guy says, you know, they're probably in their 30s. The guy said, well, my mom and dad were coming, but they won't come back here. And I said, really? He said, not after what you said. I said, you mean about homosexuality? He said, yeah, my sister's a lesbian. My mom said, I'll never walk back in that church because I address homosexuality as being an iniquity. And I said, but you're still here. He goes, oh, I know. I know what's wrong. I know what's right. But my mom wants, she can't hear that her daughter is hell-bound unless she repents. She can't hear that about her own daughter, so she'll just deny the truth and live on in deception. Pastor Ebb told me he mentioned homosexuality Sunday morning, watched a couple get up and walk out. The same-sex couple that visited, they got up and walked out. You're not going to tell me the truth. Spiritual adulterers. Whoever chooses to make the world their friend makes himself an enemy of God. Think about that. Does not the Scripture mean nothing to you that says the Spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us for it says, look at this, God resists you when you're proud. God resists you when you're proud. God stiff arms you. You come in to pray. God, I've been praying for three hours, and I don't feel your presence at all. And why should you, you proud thing? I resist you. Your prayers don't make it past the ceiling, the drywall, because you're full of pride. How in the world could the devil get us how could he get us, Stanley, to feed this stuff into our children? But he did it. We've all done it. I've done it. Like I said, I've caught myself telling someone I was proud of him like four times since I preached this about a month ago. Amen. Think about it. <laughs> so do we go on with our tradition, fuel strife, Resist God and basically disinvite his presence. When we're crying out for the manifest presence, we're disinviting him by our attitude of pride that we carry in our hearts. Or do we say, you know what? Today everything changes. I'll never look at a child and say, I'm proud of you again. I'll look at a child and say, that pleases God. That pleases God. When you do that, that pleases God, and it will go well with you. I'm so proud of you, honey. His little chest puffs up. His head grows three hat sizes. You want to destroy a young leader, tell them how great they are. I, I actually have instructed people in our church. I said, now I'm going to have this guy get up and share Sunday morning. He's a young preacher. Do not want run up and tell him how great he is after he's done. You will puff his head up. There's an old, there's a law of physics, Mike. You might have studied this, some college degree. There's a law of physics. Pat a man on the shoulder three times and his hat grows three sizes. I'm serious. We have to watch how we affirm one another. That we're doing it in the spirit of humility, bringing glory back to God in their good things. When you do a good deed, let's bring glory. Let's teach them. Look what the Lord has done for you. Isn't that awesome? Let's give God glory together. We won't create little monsters to go out and repopulate the earth with devilment. Instead, we'll create thankful children. We won't be having church splits. Because why did they get to do it and I didn't? 
I can sing better than she can. I can do this better than he can. We won't be having church splits for those reasons anymore. And there's always going to be traveling in ministry because Jesus said he was born of the spirits like the wind. You never know where he's come from. There's always going to be traveling because God has different calls for different people at different times. But this mess of I'm leaving because this, this, this. If you're leaving because of the sin of pride in your heart, do you think you're not going to infect the next place you go? If you carry that infection, you're not only going to be infected yourself, you're going to infect others. Amen. So like I say, if you really want to get to the root, we haven't even gotten to rebellion yet. Amen. You get into rebellion, that'll be another message we'll bring. We'll die again when we recognize. I gave an all, I preached the message on the sin of rebellion and revival in the church in Parkersburg. After I'd done this message a couple of weeks back, 70% of the congregation came to the altar for repentance. After the message on rebellion, not understanding, again, traditions that we call something else is actually rebellion. And we don't realize we're stopping God. This is how this began. And let me just say this. I had to eat this before I served it. I mean, that's what a good pastor does. He eats it before he serves it to you. And I tasted of this, and it is good. You know, God had to bust me all up. He had to bust me all up the first year. He said, you want more revival? Yeah. Well, you're going to have to change, son. But, man, I'll tell you another story. I don't have time to tell it tonight, but I'll tell you another story. Because I submitted to these messages God answered a prayer that I prayed for 16 years. And when he did it, I was wrecked. Wrecked. I've been crying out for 16 years. And he answered it. The minute I brought my life to a new level of obedience. That's what I'm saying. This is a death, but this is a life. This is a, the seed, you know, here's what Jesus said. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And if you younger folks can get a hold of this, I'm telling you, man, you're setting yourself up for glory. You'll be a Joseph instead of a Judas. Amen. You'll be a Paul instead of a Saul. Amen. You'll be a Peter instead of a Simon. Think of how many times these men had to be brought to humility because even under the tutelage of Jesus, nearly daily, he had to say, what are y'all fussing about now? And you know what it always came back to? Who would be the greatest? Jesus had to circle that wagon over and over and over with just 12 men. What are you fussing about now? Lord, um, I think I should seat at the right hand and John should seat at the left. I mean, their mother came. I mean, their mother. Lord, grant one thing. What? That my sons will be the star of the team. Can you imagine? Do you know why Jesus said, How long shall I bear with you? You people are wearing me out. That's today's translation of what that meant. You're wearing me out. Stop exalting yourself. Be patient and wait upon me, and you will inherit the good of the land. That's what he said. I want it now. Remember that commercial? I want it now. Fuel for the fire. Why? I deserve it now. Oh, do you? 
Amen. We need to change some of our songs. We used to sing, How great thou art. Now we need to start singing, How great I am. Come on. Are you ready to pray yet? Have I defanged you and dehorned you? Let's see. Make sure I get the roots of them horns, right? <laughs> Let me see. See if I got them horns out yet. Amen. <laughs> you know, they used to have a thing about defanging a snake. The problem is they grow back. Amen. Them old snake charmers, they defang them cobras, but they grow back. Amen. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Some of y'all might be saying about right now, I hope it's another six months before you preach again. <laughs> I don't know if I can take any more of this. You done killed me, man. Kill the beast inside of you and let the lamb live. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you've received this word tonight, we're going to pray a prayer of confession before the Lord. I'm going to ask us to help us, ask him to help us amend our ways and rethink, renew our mind. That's what the scripture says, the renewing of your mind by the word of the living God. Lord, forgive us tonight. And you just tell him yourself, forgive us tonight, Father. Forgive me tonight, Father, for ever yielding to this thing called pride or ever even thinking it was a good thing because you've said it's literally a root of evil. And one of the things you hate more than anything else, but yet we've called it okay. We've used it to appraise our children, to appraise them. We've used it to ascribe value. When in fact, your currency is the opposite. It's the opposite. It's humility. Instead of teaching our children, instead of telling them, we're so proud of you, we should be saying, now don't get a big head. Yes, you did, you did a good job, but God gave you that gift that these other boys don't have. So you remember that's a gift God gave you to help you make your way in the earth. Now, don't you dare look down on these other boys or these other girls because they don't have what you have. Be thankful. Come on, let's pray and thank the Lord right now for that little Johnny, little Mary. Let's thank the Lord right now that you won that spelling bee because he gave you such a mind to remember things. Let's thank Jesus for that. Let's create children of the kingdom instead of having them serve Leviathan, king over all the children of pride. Hallelujah. Father, just forgive us. Forgive us for this. Now, Lord, I'm asking tonight, as we've renewed our mind, I have to stop saying these words that I've said out of habit, out of tradition, Tradition throughout my lifetime. I've said them to my children, my grandchildren, our church members, our church members' children. I've made this statement I don't know how many times, and I've fueled literally the serpent's seed inside them instead of nurturing the seed of the kingdom, which is humility and thanksgiving. And thankful hearts. We've created little monsters instead of little angels by our traditions. Forgive us for exalting the things of the world when you said they're incompatible with you, even to our children. Forgive us for when we've looked at our children and taught them the values of this world system exceed the values of the kingdom. Forgive us for teaching our children that how much money they have or how much power they get 
is the success of their life instead of teaching them what godly character is. Forgive us for when we've rewarded their gifts and talents, but we've neglected to discipline their character. Oh, God, forgive us as a church for making your word not ineffective, ineffective. Forgive us for asking more from you when we've been unwilling to give you more of us. And Lord, as I stand before this house tonight and I have openly repented of so many things since you visited me this year because I cried out for more. You said, then you have to change, Dave. You want more of me in your church? You're going to have to change, son, and your church is going to have to change. And as we've been doing it, we've been experiencing more and more of you, but I am not satisfied yet. And I know there are other rooms to clean out, and I am in submission to whatever you want to do in me, Jesus. <laughs> Would you say that with me? I'm in submission to whatever you want to do with me, Jesus. Jesus, tonight, I begin a new chapter. And this chapter is called My Humility. This chapter is called My Thanksgiving. And instead of complaining, of where I am, I'm going to thank you that things are as good as they are. And they're going to get better as I obey you. They're only going to get better. And every time I trust you for my promotion, for my sustenance, for the things I need in life, for my family, my home, I trust you. And I will not violate kingdom principles to self-promote in this world system. I will not value this world's treasures, but I value your love. And I pray this in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Amen. Well, I kept you a little late, but I hope, I hope it's been a blessing to you. Amen. Oh, I know it. If you take it, it will be a blessing. Wow. Good things are coming, guys. Good things are coming. Amen. Well, we love you. It's great to see everyone again and get to yell at you again. <laughs> Get to preach to you the good word of God again. Amen. Be blessed. Have an awesome rest of the week. If you need prayer before you leave, you know the drill. Come up front. Get your prayer before you go. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks again for coming out tonight. Amen. Amen.